All right, Ephesians chapter 5. Good to have everybody with us today, both here and online. Good to have our folks from Tennessee, formerly of Wichita, Kansas, formerly of, where was it in Arkansas? Melbourne. Melbourne. All right. And then, uh, which is close to Mountain Home, you said, right? I, huh? About an hour south of there, okay. You are in the Ozark Hills, aren't you? Yes, sir. Huh? Yeah? Well, I'll be. Y'all probably could have been neighbors then. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what did I say? Ephesians? Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5. Turn there. So it's good to, have, good to fellowship with them and their little... Daughter there, Abby, made me a picture, so I'm going to put it on my door, and uh, she also went out in the yard and picked me a little flower and gave it to me, and I, I mean it, the, the, the thing that thrills me the most about um, what I do is when the, when the, kids, when the kids watch it, and they enjoy it, they I've had people tell me, said, when we turn the watchman on, it comes on over our TV. When our kids hear that music, they come running. And uh, they want to see what Pastor Mike has to say. And um, I'll tell you a story, and this is just for whoever wants to hear it. It's sort of a sad story right now, but God's not done. Um, we... Um, we were we were down. We went down to uh, Harrison, Arkansas, several years ago, uh, for when Brother Lonnie was the pastor there. He'd always have me on Saturdays down there, and so we'd go down on Thursday. And um, there's a, a family that met me there at the at the door. We was coming in, and they said, Pastor Mike. They said, um, We got somebody with us that's waiting on you, waiting to hear you, waiting to meet you. I said, who is it? They said, it's our daughter. And I won't name the name, but she had a t-shirt made that said, I am Pastor Mike Hoggard's number one fan. And so she wanted some pictures with me. And so uh, we, there were some pictures made and so on. And I've, I've got them stored somewhere. And I never forgot that. Never forgot that young lady. And so I spent some time with her during that weekend, you know, just talking while we were eating lunch and things like that. And then uh, she was there at camp. And, uh, you know, every time I was, you know, we'd go down there, she'd be there. And uh, I think she, at the time, she was probably about nine or ten years old, about the age I, when I got saved. And uh, so every year when we go down to Harrison, uh, there she'd be. And I'd, you know, give her a big hug and we'd talk a little bit, see how she's doing and everything like that. And sure enough, she'd be at camp. She, um, uh, when she was a senior in high school, um, her, I asked her mom and dad, I said, when is her graduation? And they told me, they gave me the date. And so Lisa and I went down there for her graduation. A smart young lady. And she had won some kind of scholarship and I told her, I said, that's a big deal. You know, and we gave her a present and everything like that for graduating. And then we had, after the graduation ceremony, we had, I think we went and got ice cream with her family and everything. And that was it. That was it. Um, she got into college, quit coming to church, didn't see her at camp no more. She wouldn't, she wouldn't answer any text I sent her or anything like that. Just, and I was talking to her mom and dad the whole time, and they were saying, you know, things that had happened to her and things that she was involved in and so on. And um, she's still there in my heart. I pray for her. And I pray that when she finds out, like pretty much all of us did, that the road to sin uh, has a, has a uh, stop-off place that none of us are going to like. And um, when she gets to that point, then she'll remember 
not only what I said, but what Brother Lonnie, I know what I know he preached to her, what her mom and dad taught her, what she knows to be right. Um, I just pray that when the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, some people, I think, they misunderstand that. It says when he is old, he will not depart from it. They assume that that means that if you raise them in church, teaching them Bible and, and things like that, that when they turn 18 and go out on their own, that they won't turn away from God. It doesn't mean that. Because if it meant that, then obviously something's wrong. What it says is when he is old. He will not depart from it. And I believe at some point, God, just like the prodigal son, who, let, who left the prodigal son feeding hogs? God did. God is one who did that. And um, you just think about that for a while. If God didn't want that young man to feed hogs, he wouldn't have fed hogs. If God wanted that young man to prosper and be blessed, then he would have been blessed. But God had to teach that young boy a lesson and the bible says that he came to himself it's like he he spiritually woke up and said my father's servants are living better than i'm living right now and his whole his whole hope was to be able to go back and at least be on the level of his father's servants he's i'll be dad i'll be your slave but the father who was watching every day, looking down the road. Here he comes. The Bible says he ran and met him. He didn't wait for him to come home. He ran to get him and kissed him. Put a ring on his finger and robe on his body and shoes on his feet. Had a big feast for him. The older brother got mad and jealous. And I've been living for you, Dad, all my life. And you never give me no party. And Dad, you, you don't understand, son. He was dead and now he's alive. He was blind and now he can see. And uh, so that's my hope for this young lady. It's my hope for our son. And so uh, all of you out there who have children that have grown and turned away from the Lord, don't give up. Don't give up. Uh, God can turn any, any one of them around. He turned us around. Amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, let's pick it up. Verse 19. Uh, well, we have a whole list of. Uh, sort of guidelines here to follow. Um, he says, uh, oh, let's see if we back up here. Um, uh, let's see, if we go ver back to verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Uh, that's what I'm doing right now in the Watchman series called Sightings. Uh, I am not fellowshipping with the darkness and by the way, I saw a video just this afternoon that I probably will feature in the next two weeks. It, it blows my mind um, just how, how evil looking devils manifest themselves. Uh, no wonder people get scared. No wonder people get affrighted. And I'm, I'm telling you, there's nothing to be afraid of with them. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And uh, I know it's a natural reaction for us to be fearful at things, that weird things that happen. And they might catch us off guard. And it might scare us a little bit. But just remember who's inside of you. And they can't, they do not. They might, they might oppress you and they will. As God allows them to do it. God allowed Satan to mess with Job and oppress him thinking that he would turn from God, but it didn't happen. God knew Job better than the devil did. Aren't you glad of that? Say amen. So anyway, then he says, um, uh, verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Be ye not unwise, verse 17. Verse 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Then verse 19, speaking to yourself in, yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, uh, in your heart to the Lord. Let me ask you a question while I'm thinking about it. Do drunk people sing? Yeah, drunks sing. They usually sing songs a drunkard would sing. They sing bar songs and songs about adultery and songs about drinking and songs about fights they had and everything else. 
Um, but drunks don't usually sing about the Lord. Uh, and this also applies to spiritual drunks as well. When, it, when a man or a woman is a spiritual drunk, that means they have a spirit uh, in them that does not understand doctrine, does not understand the word, does not, um, does not know who the Lord is. Um, they are not straight on the Bible. They diverge. They walk crookedly. They cannot stay in the way. They're out of the way. And um, they will always, even in their songs, they will sing false doctrine. They will sing and promote false doctrine. And I'll tell you what, songs have a way of reaching us in a way that sometimes just normal talking doesn't. Uh, it's the power of music. And uh, I thank Steve Geltz for reminding me of the, I told you the five parts of music. And he reminded me what the fifth one was. The first one is melody. And that's what it says, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. The second part is harmony. Harmony always goes along with the melody. And if the harmony um, is dissonant, in other words, if the harmony is off, it makes the melody sour to hear. We can't, we can't handle listening to it, okay? Uh, so, melody... Harmony, um, tempo, I think. No, that's not one of them. Melody, harmony, tempo, I think tempo is. Tone color, a song can be characterized as bright or a song can be characterized as dark. Okay, so tone color matters. And then he mentioned timber, not like trees falling, but T-I-M-B-R-E, which is re actually related to one of the verses we're going to see tonight. But timber has to do with uh, the types of instruments used and why you would use them. For instance, if you want a, a soft, sort of joyful sound, bright sound, would you use a tuba? No, I played the tuba and you wouldn't use it. Um, you would use a flute, clarinet, piccolo, any of the wind instruments like uh, maybe a tenor saxophone, things like that. Uh, those are all bright. Uh, then you have the, the violins, the high strings. Uh, they have a bright sound to them. Um, if you want a... Uh, an emphatic, bombastic sound, you wouldn't use piccolos and flutes. You would use brass. You would use trumpets, uh, trombones, euphoniums, or a baritone horn, French horns especially. I love, I play, started out playing French horn, French horn in school. And I love the French horn sound. It just gives a oomph to songs that, may be missing. Um, the song I sing, He's Alive, uh, I've had that soundtrack since 1985 on a cassette. I've still got the cassette. I've, I've taken the song, cut, so, sort of remastered it a little bit, cut out some of the tape sound, and then um, I, I added in the last half of the song, French horns. That's all I did. And those French horns took it up to an, a different level as far as how the, how the ending verses are and how the chorus comes out. Um, it, it worked really well. But that's all I did was add French horns. So you would use French horns, uh, trombones, baritones, tubas, uh, any kind of horn like that. That's what you would use for uh, like an emphatic sound, emphatic timber. Um, there are, if you want, I don't know how to describe this, but you would use like a piano, um, or, uh, or maybe an organ, uh, for a completely different sound, but it all has, it has its own, I can't identify all the different types of sounds, but they all have a different sound to them. Even the apostle Paul mentioned that, I think first Corinthians 13, when he's talking about 
uh, charity, or maybe in 1 Corinthians 14, when he's talking about tongues, I think is what it is. So anyway, let me move on with this. Let's read this. Um, Ephesians 5, 19 again. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and mel making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now I want to go back to verse 20, because it just... It dawned on me what I was preaching this morning about God being sovereign and God even to the point of allowing bad things to happen to us. Notice verse 20. Giving thanks how often? And for how many things? All things. He, that's not just talk. He means it. You give thanks unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we pray how we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. But we're to give thanks even for the bad things that happen. They are done by a loving God who loves you so much that He allowed His sinless, perfect, Son, only begotten Son, to suffer, be tormented, and die on the cross. If you ever doubt God's love for you, remind yourself of Jesus. And John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so even the bad things that happen to people, Bad things that happen to us adults that we go through. Children cannot understand what adults deal with throughout their life. Um, you know, contradictions, losing friends, losing family members, people dying close to us. All of those things shape us and make us who we are. Uh, things that happened to us when we were children, whether they were good things or whether they were bad things. You give thanks unto God even for the rotten, terrible things that you endured, the things that you went through. Give thanks unto the Lord because that may be how God brought you to the cross. So when it comes to questioning God, it is okay, I believe, to ask God, why God, why did, th why did this happen? God, why did that happen? But as far as understanding whether or not God loves you or not, of course He does. You're the one he died for. You're the one he gave his life for. You're the one he shed his blood for. Cruel, cruel instrument of torture the crucifixion was. So anyway, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. and Teach us great things, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Uh, we went through last week what a psalm was. Let me very quickly, a, so a sacred poem or song, especially one expressing praise and thanksgiving. Uh, it comes to us, Old English word, it comes to us from a Latin word, psalmus, uh, Greek word, psalmos, meaning song sung to a harp. Uh, that's from the scriptures as well. Uh, originally, it meant a performance on a stringed instrument or plucking of the harp uh, and so on. Um, turn to Psalm 81. I spent a lot of time talking about music. Last Sunday night, uh, I don't think I got into all the scriptures though. Turn to Psalm 81. I may have, but I, I don't think I spent enough time on them. Uh, and I've, you know, having grown up in church, I've seen... Trends come and go, fads come and go, music styles come and go. Um, some of the things that may seem fine now, uh, at one time, were condemned. I'll give you an example. Um, I remembered this song from when I was a, a young teenager. It was a song sung by a group called the Imperials, and it was called O Buddha. And um, I had bought a soundtrack of that from the Christian bookstore. And I remember singing it here once as a teenager. 
And the pastor and a couple of the guys in the church really took issue with it. They didn't like it. And they said, if it moves the foot before it moves the heart and, and that stuff. And I thought, well, I think it's a good song. And uh, so they didn't let me sing it. Now, I'm the pastor. And I can make my own soundtracks. So I made my own soundtrack. Put my own vocals on there. Played the piano on it, the bass guitar, and all that stuff. And made my own soundtrack. And it's one of my better songs. And everybody seems to like it. I think it's Megan. I think Megan's, that's her favorite song. Um... The song I sang this morning. Back when I was young, we had a pastor who would have frowned on that with a great big frown. Frown to hang all the way down to his belly. And uh, he just didn't go for that. He made a family in our church very, very angry. He was so tightly wound, and I, I would say legalistic. He... Um, there was a, a couple of young ladies that came here back then and uh, they were in high school, then they went to college and one of them found a boyfriend, a Christian boyfriend at college. I think they went to Mizzou. And um, she would bring him here, you know, when they come back on vacation and stuff like that. And uh, she eventually married this guy, but um, he had a good voice and she had a good voice. And so when they would come, they would ask if they could sing together. And one pastor we had let them sing. The next pastor we got, he didn't like the guy because he had a beard. This is 1977, okay? And court, he was from a group of churches that the only men that grow beards are hippies. That was his thinking. And so he wouldn't let him sing because he had a beard. And that ended up being part of his downfall here. Was that he was very, very overly strict on everything. And let me ask you a question. Does the Bible have a problem with a man growing a beard? Um... It doesn't. It's not there. And so I, I've learned that some of the things that I heard were sins were not sins. That's why I get so picky about it. But anyway, Psalm 81, look at verse 1. And, and to think that there would be drums used in a song, that was a no-no. So, sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Now, now I think, God's music, for the most part, should be joyful in some way, shape, or form. We certainly would not ever sing a song that the lyrics and the, the tone of it left people in hopelessness. Where we would sing a song maybe about Jesus dying on the cross and then leaving it there. And not... Not explaining the great salvation that comes from that. Singing a, a lament, as it were, that Christ had to be murdered and his blood spilled everywhere. And that's the end of the song. I, I, I think we ought to sing it out and tell the good news. Amen. Uh, make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Verse 2. Take a psalm. Take a psalm. So we got the book of Psalms here. We got, we got words. And bring hither the timbrel. Notice you have the word timber in timbrel. Take off the L and you have that fifth part of music that I couldn't remember last week. Timber. And that is when you have a tambourine in your hand. And the sound that a tambourine makes when you're keeping it in rhythm with the song. Does it make a... Um, a lamenting sound or a joyful sound? Joyful. It's a, it's a high ring, okay? And that is pleasing to us. Um, I like to 
uh, when I'm making, maybe working on a soundtrack, go through verse one with not so many instruments, sing the chorus, and then when I maybe get into verse two, add a tambourine on that off rhythm, mm, ping, mm, ting, mm, ting, mm, ting, like that, and then hit it for the for the chorus, chicka 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 chicka, like that. Okay, uh, it just it, it adds to the song. It it brings it. You know, you're you're building something up here when you're singing and when you're playing, and you're building up to the end. And the end is where the, where the joy should be found. And so right here you have percussion instruments. They do not make a certain sound. In other words, there are not B flat tambourines and um, A flat tambourines and the key of F tambourines. There's not, they don't come in keys. They are just little bitty bells ringing together uh, touching one another and making a real bright metallic sound. So you have, and they keep the rhythm, either on the on beat, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or on the off beat, one, two, three, four, like that. Either way you do it, it's going to add to the song and it helps keep the rhythm of the song. Every song's got to have a rhythm. Trust me. I looked up hymns on Wikipedia today. Now, the word hymn actually goes back thousands of years. Hymns were always sung to any kind of God. The Greeks had hymns to their gods. The Romans had hymns to their gods. The, believe it or not, the people of India, the Hindus, they have hymns that are written in their literature that goes back one to 2,000 years before Christ. And I listened, they had an example on the Wikipedia website, and I listened to it, and it was the awfulest thing I've ever heard in my life. It was, number one, it was in Sanskrit, which they believe is a holy language. And um, this guy was singing it, and it was two notes. This guy would go, and it was like that for like four minutes. And I'm going, oh, would this thing hurry up and get over with? I wanted to see if it changed. It didn't. Okay? So anyway, uh, hymns go back years. Anyway, we have the timbrel, so we have, we have percussion instruments. Number two, what kind of harp? Look at the words. Look at what how look at the adjective here describing harp. Don't just play a mess. Play a pleasant harp. And a harp uh, would be any kind of plucked instrument, whether it's a harp um, or a, a guitar. Banjo. Did you know heavy metal groups never use a banjo? Okay? It's, you can't sing heavy metal rock and roll with a banjo. A banjo just automatically has a bright, joyful sound to it. And our forefathers knew that. That's why they played the thing. That's why they made the thing. It, it, I think it comes from over Scotland, in Ireland maybe. And, but anyway, it's a sort of an American sound. And a lot of songs have been written and played on the banjo and it's a beautiful sound. I like a good banjo. I bought me a banjo one time and uh, I was so proud of myself. I thought, man, I'm going to learn this thing. Reg Kelly was here preaching that week. So I went in my office, I got my banjo out. And I said, brother, get Reg, look what I'm fixing to learn how to play. He said, Mike, let me see that. And I gave it to him. He took off playing that thing. And I'm going... I didn't know you played the banjo. And he was good too. And he said, Mike, I grew up on a farm milking cows. What do you think I did out beside kick rocks? He said, I learned to play the banjo. So I gave up. I gave it to Matthew. Yeah, I gave up on it. So anyway, uh, um, a psalm, bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp, with a psaltery, a psaltery is like 
I mentioned this last week. It's, a, it's like a, um, uh, what am I trying to think of? A hammered dulcimer. Okay, that's, an, that's a, 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 a psaltery. So in that, our version, we still have hammered dulcimers, but a piano does the same thing. It strikes the strings rather than plucking the strings. And I would say that the piano is probably the mainstay of just about every church, that or an organ, of just about every church that there was. And speaking of organs, that's, that's a piped instrument. And uh, we'll probably see that. Well, we see here in verse 3, blow up the trumpet. So that, that would involve practically any of the brass instruments that we now have. Trumpets, cornets, uh, trombones, euphoniums, uh, tubas. Um, am I missing anything? I don't think. Uh, French horns. Um, blow up the trumpet in the new moon and in the, appoint, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel and a law uh, of the God of Jacob. Now, uh, turn to Psalm 95. And I mentioned to you before that the latter Psalms, like around from 80 on, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily deal with praising God. So Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let us sing unto who? Unto the Lord. So when I'm singing up on the stage, I'm singing to the Lord. I'm making melody. If you like it, that's wonderful. If I make mistakes, that's on me. But I truly want to worship God and I want people to know that what I sing, I believe. I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. Okay? Uh, if I don't believe the song, I don't sing it. It's very simple. Okay? So, let us make a... Uh, come let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. There he says joyful noise again. Um, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. He's God of all gods. Amen. Colossians 3.16. Let me run through some of these because I want to get to hymns here. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell, he's basically saying the same thing in Ephesians, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, listen to this, psalms and hymns teach people things. So be careful what you sing. You can teach people unrighteousness, especially nowadays. Listen, uh, when uh, Brother uh, Edward... Um, uh, can't think of his name. Huh? Yeah, Edward Bell. Right after the whole uh, Ferguson thing, stood up in our church and testified. He said, Mike, it's the music that's teaching our children in the black community. It's the music that's teaching them to hate white people to hate cops, to hate any kind of authority, to rebel against it, to even to kill if necessary, and teaching them some of the most vile, disgusting things on how to treat women, teaching them uh, gangster themes, teaching them all of these things, and these people are elevated, who sing this music, this rap stuff, and, and hip-hop, are elevated above almost to the point of being a god. They, can, they think they can get by with anything. How many rap singers are in prison right now? Because they lived what they sang. They were not making it up. But they're teaching it. You've got little children listening to that kind of junk going into their minds from a young age. So... Music has the ability to teach people. And we should teach them uh, doctrine. Uh, what was that? Yeah, Colossians 3. 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you got grace in your hearts, then you can sing it. Amen. James chapter 5 verse 13 said, Is any among you or any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And there's nothing that I like to do better than when I'm feeling good, I want to sing. I want to sing the old gospel songs. Now, let's change over to hymns. Making, singing and making melody in your heart, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What is a hymn? A hymn, um, one of the sources I have, I couldn't find it, I couldn't remember where I got it from, was used in the Septuagint to translate several Hebrew words meaning a song praising God. Let me explain what the Septuagint is. The Septuagint is um, the Old Testament translated into Greek. Um, there was, it's called, the, in, in notation, it's LXX. It's called the 70. And there were 70 Jewish scholars that took the Old Testament and translated it into Greek. I don't remember how long, it's been a long time ago, thousands of years or whatever. Uh, but when they saw certain words in Hebrew, they translated them in Greek to the word hymnos. And it meant a song praising God. Is that rain? Yeah. Uh, Webster said a hymn basically means to sing in praise or adoration. And like I said, you can, you can go back uh, and look at historically, um, even the pagan religions sang hymns to their God or to the gods. They usually would express uh, things that they knew about their God or things that they believed about their God. Some of the myths and some of the fables and stories that were told uh, by the religious crowd, somebody would put them to song and they would sing these songs uh, in these pagan temples. So the word hymn is not necessarily tied down to Christianity. However, in this day and age, primarily a hymn is going to be a Christian hymn of some kind. Now, some of those songs should not be sung in a Bible-believing church. For example, we don't sing... Ave Maria. Why don't we? That's Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Pray for us, Mary. Uh, 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 Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. We're not going to sing that here. Amen. We're not going to sing that here. Uh, the song that is uh, that the lyrics were put to was, I think, written by Bach, and it was not a, a, a hymn to Mary. It was called the Well-Tempered Clavier, and I won't get into all that, but it was a song that Johann Sebastian Bach wrote. Um, again, I'd have to go into a big, long explanation about why he wrote it and why it sounds the way it does. Somebody came along later and added the melody and the lyrics to Hail Mary. Um, I happen to like the song, but anyway, I don't like the lyrics of it. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't sing that here in this church. We wouldn't sing anything about the host, the communion becoming the body of Christ. We wouldn't sing anything like that at all. So you got to be careful about what you're singing. And I'll say this too. A lot, a lot of so-called Christian music, especially contemporary Christian music, may not be written by Christians. You need to understand the music business is just that. It is a business. It is not a ministry. These big publishing companies and these big recording companies are not in it for the ministry. They're in it for the money. If they can make, if they can make songs that everybody likes, they can sell them to the churches, and by the way, I've explained this before. A lot of churches now have done away with their hymnals. What has replaced them is they sign a contract with a music publishing company. And every three months, 
that church gets a whole brand new set of music. They get the rights to sing the music. They get the rights to publish the words like up on the screen. They get the rights to uh, publish the lyrics maybe on, on paper for people to look at. And they have certain rights, but they don't have a right to just sing it uh, without paying the contract price. So, and I know this because we used to get stuff all the time in the mail um, wanting to put us into a contract where they would send us music every three months. And brand new songs. So what, by the time you learned the songs that came out in January, this is now April, a different quarter has started. Now we got whole new songs for everybody to sing. That's why you don't know. If you go visit somebody else's church, you have no idea what they're singing. And you don't know where the music came from. Uh, but a lot of it, you can mark it down. They're going to start out with some heavy rock sounding song. Almost without fail. They're going to get everybody up, stomping their feet, clapping their hands. Th then they'll transition during that to something s smooth and flowing just before the preacher comes out and gives the message. It's all designed specifically. So uh, just be careful about some of the songs you pick up on. They may not be what you think it is. Um, oh, 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 we're getting there. Turn to, uh, turn to uh, Matthew 26. We're getting there. Oh, we're getting there. I got a verse. I got a verse to show you. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Matthew 26, verse one verse here. This is when they are uh, doing the Lord's Supper. If you look at verse 28, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, verse 30 simply says, and when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Okay, so uh, I've even had some people believe that uh, you don't sing in church. This is ridiculous what some people come up with. Um, probably the same guy that said the Bible is the mark of the beast. Yeah. But clearly, you have the disciples and Jesus gathered together. They have uh, the Passover supper. And before they leave, they all sung a hymn. And remember, a hymn um, is not directly limited to Scripture only. Um, it is a song given in praise and adoration to God and or His attributes. Like we sang tonight. Oh Lord my God, when I an awesome one. That word awesome there tells you that it's a hymn. All right, we're, we're praising God and giving Him thanks. So that was the style of song that they sung. We don't know what they, the words were. We don't know the tune that they were singing. But... This is getting to where we're going. Jesus was there singing it with them. Now, I don't know if you ever thought of this. But when I read this next verse, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. When I read this next verse, it's like joy lifted me up, set me on a cloud. And I was absolutely elated. And I was like, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. When I read this. I don't know if you've ever thought about what it sounds like when Jesus sings. Now, you've heard my voice singing. Uh, you could probably recognize it if you heard a recording of it. Um... Singers are primarily known by the sound of their voice. Um, you take any, any singer, any singer. It doesn't matter if they sing opera. Um, Luciano Pavarotti is known for his voice. He is an operatic tenor. He can sing notes that some women can't sing. 
in a natural voice, not a falsetto voice, a natural voice. He was gifted with that. He made his living with that. And um, he sang until he died. Um, if I were to say Conway Twitty, we know what Conway Twitty sounds like. George Jones, we know what George Jones sounds like. Loretta, I see, I'm telling my age. Loretta Lynn, I don't know anybody, I don't know who's out there that sings country music anymore. Uh, if I were to say Lady Gaga, okay, she's known by her voice. Um, oh, Katy Perry, known by her voice, and so on. But have you ever thought of what it would be like to be standing next to Jesus or sitting next to him and he starts singing? Remember, this is God. This is God. God is bound to have a voice that is unlike the voice of fallen man. And I'm just, I'm weighing this out in my mind as I'm reading this verse. And I just, I'm like, I cannot even fathom what that's like. I just know that I want to hear it. So in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews quotes a lot of the Old Testament. And they're quoting the Old Testament here. In verse 11, <clears throat> let me clear my voice here. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now here's what that means. It means even though we are sinners, Christ has sanctified us and he's not ashamed of us. Amen. Amen. So it says, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I at times have referred to Jesus as Lord, Savior, Master, King, one that sticketh closer than a brother, a friend, and a brother. And that's biblical. Christ considers us his brethren. Okay? So that means Christ is our brother because we are born of God. The new man in us is born of God. So verse 12, saying, and they're quoting from the Old Testament, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And I did. When I read that, I had a bigger smile on my face than I got right now. I, I was elated at that. I had never really paid attention to that before. And I had some people when we would go to Fargo, it was a, a lady and her uh, adult daughter, uh, they asked me one time, they said, you said one time that you, you can't wait to hear Jesus sing. What verse was that? And I could not remember it to save my life. And finally I found it one day, and uh, I hope I never forget it. That Jesus, one of these days, we're going to hear him sing, surrounded by us. I, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That's Jesus saying that. And again, Jesus says, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Whew. Number one, I am both honored, blessed, and humbled by the fact that Jesus is not ashamed to call me brother. That right there is enough to convince me, Mike, keep marching on. Number two, I can't wait to hear Jesus sing. Because apparently he's going to when we all get up there, Sister Betty. Jesus is going to stand in the midst of his congregation, his church, his people. And he's going to start singing. Whew. 
No wonder we will bow before him. When a, when a really good singer, and I mean a really good singer, sings their best song, and they do it with skill, they do it with precision, they do it with feeling and emotion, it lifts our souls up. I don't care what kind of music it is. It lifts our souls up. It could be, what I mean by that is secular music or gospel music. It can lift our souls up in a way that nothing else can. Music has that ability. But then when we hear Jesus and his backup choir of two-thirds of the angels in heaven, an innumerable amount as a backup choir, I have a trick that I use when I add uh, vocals to a song I'm singing is something I learned years ago. You sing each part about three or four different times. And it gives it a, a sort of a chorus effect. When I sing, uh, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful, um, Lisa and, and Caleb were making fun of me. Because I, even in a falsetto voice, I can't sing, some notes are too high for me. Well, I have a fix for that. So I'm singing these lyrics in a falsetto voice, and I use the computer to change the notes of each word. Okay? And I did that. I sang each part like four times. And they were laughing at me. Okay? You hear me in there singing into a microphone, no music or nothing, I have earphones on. So they come in laughing. I said, you just hang on a second. And I did what I did. It took me about an hour to do it. And when I finally got done, I said, now come in here and listen. And I said, it sounds like I have a 20-piece chorus behind me of women and men because of the software that I was using. It's a trick I have. Okay, So I can make myself into a choir if I want to. Um, but Jesus is going to sing with his backup, the angels, okay? Capital A, the angels, Jesus and the angels. That's his group. And we're going to get to hear that. That excites me enough to where I want to go. I've seen the cathedrals twice years ago, back when they were singing and, uh, enjoyed the concert both times. The only concert I'm interested in hearing now is that one. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.